um, Sunday service. And I pray, as we are going to our open heaven this morning, God can open our eyes to new things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, will bless you this morning. We thank you, Lord, because you are ever faithful God. We appreciate you, Lord, for another opportunity given unto us. Father, in your name alone, be praised in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we have come this morning, Lord, to listen to you, Father, Lord, speak to us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let our heaven be open in the name of Jesus. Amen. Because your name is above all other names. That Lord, O oh God, we pray this morning, your name shall perform wonders in our life in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, everlasting Father. Amen. For in Jesus' mighty name we are praying. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, welcome, church. Our topic today for our open heaven is the name above all others. The name above all others. Our memory verse is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 16, verse 17. I read from here. And this sign you shall follow them that believe in my name. That believe in my name shall they cast out devils and shall speak with new tongues. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And our Bible reading is taken from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse verse 5 to 11 I read let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God taught it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, and be found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of the things in heaven and the things in the earth, and things under the earth, and that, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We can see that the name of Jesus Christ is above all other names. At the mentions of this name, we chose our power ways. We chose how, you know, uh, wonderful that name is, that every knee should bow, not even on the earth alone, under the earth, even in also the level as well, that every knee should bow. Are we making use of this name? Are we making use of this name in the way we should? I pray God will open our eyes to kneel to him about his name this morning in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is powerful and matchless. As believers, we can perform mighty signs through it, as we see in the memory verse today. It can also bring salvation, as we see in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 21. The Bible says, And she bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Not only that the name of Jesus can save us from our sin, but it can also deliver us from evil, from the devil himself. It can also deliver us from every challenge or every difficulty that we may be facing. I pray God's name will be exalted in our life this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. He said the name of Jesus is full of wonders. In the book of Acts chapter, chapter 3 verse 6, Peter used it to raise a crippled man at the beautiful gate. Immediately, he mentioned his name. The feet and the ankle bone of the lame man received strength and he began to make progress in life. Praise the Lord. Amen. This particular man was stagnant. He remained stranded at the beautiful gate. But at the mention of this 
a, a great name is is uh, uh, what's it called? Is led his uncle. Everything receive healing. Everything receive uh, a strength, and he begin to make progress. I pray everywhere we have stranded in the journey of our life, we are making progress this morning in the name of Amen. Jesus. Because this name is so powerful. Even when we see that everything seems, you know, to, to not to be moving. But as the mention, as the mentions of this name, everything will begin to make more. I pray that God will open doors unto us this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. And he started working. And a while later, he began to live in the name of Jesus. Nothing will be impossible for us this morning in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. What is that thing? We have, you know, you know um, heard about many people, you know, talking about maybe they are in a dream. And, you know, maybe something happened to them in that dream. And they make mention of that name. And everything stopped. And we can also see, many people also apply this um, uh this um, uh, style, you know, in every situation they find themselves, in every situation they face, at the name of that name, at the mention of that name, everything will begin to make progress. I pray God will help us this morning in the name of Jesus mm -hmm. to open our hearts to the important, to the, you know, the possibility in this name. God shall open our eyes to see more this morning in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Those who do not believe in the name for salvation do not know what they are missing. You see, even the devil himself, when you mention the name of Jesus, he disappears. That is the devil that even creates problems in the world. When you mention the name of Jesus Christ, everything stands still. Everything receives peace. I pray every storm of life, even before us, we pray this morning, everything shall be still in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 18, uh, verse 10, says, he said, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and he said, the name of Jesus is a strong tower. The name of Jesus is a game changer. The name of Jesus is, you know, is the perfect place. It's the perfect place where we can be, where we can be saved. I pray God will help us in the name of Jesus. A strong tower, and the righteous run unto it. And he said, at the name of this Jesus, we can be saved. At the name, mention of the name of Jesus, we can be delivered. We can be set free. Why are we, why are we not making use of this name rightly? Why are we not apply this wisdom? In every situation we find ourselves, I pray God will help us this morning in the name of Jesus. Here we see a fundamental principle that is behind the working of that name. Righteousness. You need to be righteous. You need to have faith in him. You need to surrender your life to him before this name can work efficiently for you. I pray God will help us this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Only the righteous obtained through Jesus can make his name work wonders for you. As a matter of fact, it is through this name that we receive forgiveness of sin. We see, even whenever we pray, we always end that prayer with in the name of Jesus. Just to show how important this name is. Just to show how powerful this name can be. I pray God will help us this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In the book of Acts chapter 9 verse 33 to 34, we can also see the supremacy of this name of Jesus Christ. When Peter healed a man who was eight years being bound by infirmity, the name of Jesus destroyed yokes and delivered your prayers. You see, if you are oppressed, you have solution this morning. If you are in danger, you have solution this morning. Just give your life to Christ. Just surrender your life to Christ and make use of this name and make use of it effectively. I pray God will help us this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I was, I, I, I read the Lord said, said, I want to ask a story of a young Christian who shouted the name of Jesus when the boat he was in was in power to capsize. Immediately on seeing as steady, steady his boat from today. That name will begin to work wonders for us in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we believe in this name, as we walk in line with this name, 
Every yoke, every storm of life shall stop in the name of Jesus. Amen. The devil may resist anything. He may resist anything else, but not the name of Jesus. Devil can even be when you are still singing. Devil can just be watching you. He can even be looking at you. But as you mention that name, devil himself will flee. I pray every difficulty, every storm, every problem around us or around our family. As you mention the name of Jesus Christ this morning, everything shall stop in the name of Jesus. Amen. This is because the name of Jesus is above every other. As it mentioned, every name should bow. Praise the Lord. Amen. Every name should bow. Regardless of how powerful, you know, I have listened to a man of God when he was saying, he said, ah, you don't need to present to God how, your pro how big your problem is, but present unto your problem how big your God is, how big the name of Jesus is. Present it to, the, to, 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 to that difficulty, to that problem you are facing. You see that difficulty, that problem, that situation will disappear. Mm -hmm. I pray God will help us this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. You see, we should always make use of this name effectively. We should know how powerful we are as we believe in this name, as we live according to his commandment. I pray for the day on, God shall begin to open unto us in a new way in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the living Jesus. Hallelujah. I pray, we, I, I know that you have already, you know, learned something on, you know, receive an, another dimension of the name of Jesus this morning. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage us that we should always make use of this powerful name. I pray as we continue in that line, God shall continue to answer us and begin to make, you know, break way for us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Lord, let us pray. Let's say, Father, Father, say, Father, Father with, faith, with faith, every mountain we, we are facing must break down today in the must name of Jesus. Today, yeah. Every mountain, every problem we are facing, down, every down, issue down, we are down, facing, down, though this down, morning we are breaking them away, we are destroying them by the name of Jesus. We are breaking them with every mountain that we are facing. They must give way today. As we are mentioning this name, that every mountain, every difficulty, every problem, we, we must give way this morning in the name of Jesus, that our life will never remain the same. Thank you, everlasting Father. For in Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Hallelujah. Good morning, church. We are welcome once again to the presence of God. And we pray in the name of Jesus, every obstacle and mountains on our way shall give way in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to our Sunday school. Can we quickly bow down our head as we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for bringing us to your presence once again. Thank you, Lord Jesus, because you are here with us. Thank you, Lord, for your word that we have been hearing and we are about to hear again. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for we will not hear this word in vain in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord, because we are going to speak to every one of us and you will transform our life to becoming like you. So we become like Jesus in our thoughts, in our ways, in our action, in the mighty name of Amen. Jesus. We give you all glory, Lord, be the exalted mighty King. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Today in our Sunday school, we'll be looking at the topic titled Sexual Intimacy in Marriage. Mm -hmm. Sexual Intimacy in Marriage. And this is going to be a series. So today we are starting with part one, Sexual Intimacy in Marriage, part one. And quickly, last week we looked at lasting legacy. That is the lasting legacy that our forefathers has given unto us, the children. As a Christian, our lasting legacy is godly one. It's, it's maintaining the law of God, following the, the instruction. And there we learn that it's very important for the fathers to lay down a good foundation for the children. We look at how to live a lasting legacy and how to out the benefits of having a godly legacy. The, those are the things we talked about and we learned last week. So today, let's start. Sexual intimacy in marriage, part one. Our text shall be taken from Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15 to 20. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15 to 20. The Bible says, 
Drink water from your own safe drink. Running water from your own well. Should your spring overflow in the street, in the street, your spring of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with the strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may, your, may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. Verse 19 says, A loving dog, a grateful day, may our breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with our love. Verse 20, Why, my son, be intoxicated with another man's wife? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? Hallelujah. Amen. You can see today that God is concerned about every details of our life, even including our sexual intimacy. So it's not, it's not a sin to, to talk about it. It's not a sin for the Lord to make us to understand more about it. And that is what we'll be looking at. From that text that we read today, we will see that Proverbs chapter 5, from verse 5, when we start from verse 5, we discuss mainly sexual intimacy and integrity. Sexual intimacy and sexual integrity. There he identifies some, uh, some expression, some expression we can use in sexual intimacy. The first one we can see in that place that we just read is that Bible encourage us to drink water out of our own sea drain, that is from our own world. From our own, from our own spouse, from your own husband and your own, your own wife. So that means that sexual integrity is very important to you. You cannot say that oh, I'm, I'm I'm tired of this woman. I've been with her for thirty or fifty years. No, it's for life. No, I love because you need to be intoxicated every day. And then also we learn that let them be to your own alone and not to strangers. That means that the, 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 the satisfaction you need from your spouse, you should get it from her or from him alone, not from strangers or anyone. Amen. Amen. And there is a lot of things that that uh, chapter 5, of Proverbs chapter 5 that we write, is, is making us to understand that we must shower our, our affection on our spouse alone. His love or our love alone should intoxicate us, not of the strange man outside or a strange woman outside. Amen. So our memory verse is from Psalms of Solomon. Psalms of Solomon chapter 1 verse 13. I read those. A bundle of mail is where beloved unto me. He shall lie all night between my breasts. No, a bundle of male is well belong to me. He shall lie all night between her breasts. This is referring to, to sexual relationship between a man and a woman. Not just a man and a woman, between an husband and his wife. Amen. Amen. So let's start with the meaning of sexual intimacy. When we are talking about sexual intimacy, what does it mean? It means uh, a bond, a special bond between couples, between husband and wife, where they share their sensual expression. You know, in that place, you can touch, you can do, you can, you can express your emotion. That is what we refer to as sexual intimacy. They understand each other sexual level that has an uh, emotion behind it. And instead of just being a physical art, so it's not just the physical art alone we are talking about there. We are talking about the emotion behind it. We are talking about being knitted together. Amen. Amen. Sexual intimacy generates pleasure and natural satisfaction. And God encouraged this. It's not a sin. No, God encouraged this pleasure and natural satisfaction. It is an obligation as in marriage. So when a, a man marries his wife, it's, it's the duty of the husband, is the duty of the wife to carry out this. Amen. Amen. It is a complex expression of love in which it's, it goes beyond Baba or any oral communication. No, you, 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 you express your love, your desire in form of sexual intimacy. It gives the husband and wife a chance to express all the good feelings and the thoughts they have towards each other. Amen. So quickly, people of God, today we'll be looking at two main topics. The first one we start with will be some facts about sexual intimacy in marriage. Bible it doesn't want us to be ignorant. 
You want us to be aware of everything so that Satan will not take advantage of us. You know, everything God has created, Satan is doing his counterfeit to, to, to distort the plan of God. But as children of God, we need to know what we have been freely given, the gift of God, and this is part of it also. So we are going to start with those facts about sexual intimacy. Amen. Amen. The first question uh, I'm going to ask this morning is, is, is sex in marriage wrong or dirty? Because those are the main things people talk. No, but no, in fact, some people have prayed, have gone to the extreme. When you mention sex, no, their mind is like, oh, no, as a child of God, you need to be spiritual. No, and the truth of the matter today, this morning, is that sex is spiritual. Sex is spiritual. So the question we need to start to, to answer today is, is sex in marriage wrong or dirty? Then we are going to look at the answer in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2 to 5. We get the answer there. And then when we turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians 7 from verse 2, you discover that the Bible says that each man should have sexual relationship with his own wife. And the same applies to the wife. You have sexual relationship with your husband alone. Husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife. And the same thing, wife also, you need to fulfill your marital duty to your husband. And that place makes us to understand that your body is not for you alone. Your body you need to you share between yourself. Your body is not for you alone. So we can we can say the answer there is no. That is, says in marriage, you know the question that says that says in marriage, is it wrong or, or, or is it right? We can see that having says in marriage is right. Amen. Let, let's look at the second question. How did God establish says in marriage? How does God establish that? We can find the answer when we turn to uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 to 25. No, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 to 25, Bible makes us to understand that the purpose of sex in marriage is to unite the, the, the husband and the wife, to make them to become one flesh. Amen. Amen. The purpose is that they, they will no longer be two anymore, but they will rather be one. So, sex in marriage, you no know, God established sex in marriage so that there will be oneness, there will be unity, there will be one flesh. Amen. Amen. So, it's for mutual pleasure. So both of the both the husband and the wife need to enjoy the mutual pleasure they can derive from 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 sex. And another reason why God established sex in marriage is for procreation, for multiplication, for increase, for fruitfulness. Genesis chapter one verse twenty eight. The Bible makes us to understand that God decreed bless man and He said that we should be fruitful, we should increase, we should multiply, we should replenish the earth. And God is so great. No, God does not need to be creating Adam, Adam, Adam. No. God just created Adam and he put the principle in Adam. That is, Adam starts bringing forth all other children. And as Adam are bringing forth, we are replenishing the earth, fulfilling the, the mandate of God. So those are the reasons why God established sex in marriage. If you have any other reason, you can just put it in the comments below the reason why God uh, established sex in a marriage another question we have this morning is um under what condition is sexual intimacy allowed by god under what condition is sexual intimacy allowed by god and we go to genesis chapter 4 verse 1 to answer that question and there we learn that God made Adam, you know, and God made Adam to make love to his wife, and his wife Eve gave birth to, to Cain, and after that they make love again, they gave birth to Abel. So we can see that it was in the context of marriage. God, uh, Adam did not make love to an animal. Adam did not make love to Steve, not at all. He made love to Eve. Who is, a, who is a woman. So we must be careful that my, whenever we are talking about sex, we are not talking about those people that are dating themselves about to marry. Not at all. Sex can only be condoned in the context, or in the context of marriage. So that is the only condition you can have sexual intimacy. Hallelujah. A godly one. Godly sexual intimacy can only be done in marriage. Now let's look at the next question. 
What role does satisfaction, satisfaction, satisfactory sexual intimacy provide in marriage? That is, when you are having sexual intimacy, when, when you get to the, the, the climax, the, the satisfactory level, what role, what is the importance of it in marriage? And we can find that answer in that text that we read this morning, our text, which is Proverbs chapter 5, from verse 15 to 20. You can see that it's very important. He developed our physical, psychological, and emotional relationship. You can see how the, 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 the Bible explaining that you should drink water only from your sin crave, only from your world. Well. You know, by that, you, get, you, you know one another better. You develop your emotional better psychologically you know yourself better so this is very important for us to get satisfaction in our sexual intimacy hallelujah it provides opportunity for care and mutual demonstration of love when you reach satisfactory level it gives you an advantage to express your love it gives you advantage to take care of one another and you can see this in songs of solomon chapter 4 from verse 1 to 7 songs of solomon chapter 4 from verse 1 to 7 let's look at another question what is the duration of marital relationship it's forever it doesn't have a duration you cannot say that okay we are going to have sexual intimacy for maybe five years or maybe after we are 50 years old we are already old no we are not supposed to be doing it till death do you apart according to the word of god is forever and we can see that in matthew chapter 19 verse 4 to 6 bible make us to understand that whatever god has joined together let no man put asunder if we include in sexual intimacy is forever because it's god that instituted it hallelujah so it is a lifelong affair for couples it doesn't have a duration as long as you live you need to continue to have sexual intimacy then another question arises: what sort of pleasure could both husband and wife derive from sexual activities what sort of pleasure could both husband and wife derive from sexual activities the answer is sexual climates no it's, it's very important because when you get to that level you're able to know your the emotion of your husband better and even the wife and it, it brings the satisfaction it satisfied the both spouse in that case the husband will not you know when the husband, husband is fully satisfied he will not have any cause to look at another strange woman outside or the wife looking at another strange man outside so it's very important for us to get to that sexual climate and we can see this also in Songs of Solomon chapter 1, verse 2. Songs of Solomon chapter 7, verse 3, they also say the same thing. Then, let's look at another question. Should a spouse or, or with toad sex? Is a question. Should a spouse or with, those, with toad sex? The answer is no. Under no circumstance should the spouse or sex or with toad it. In fact, it's, it's wickedness. When, when maybe your spouse do something that you are not okay with and you know, okay, I will wait for you so as a woman. You no, know, most wives always behave good like that way. It's not godly at all. No matter the circumstance, sex should not be a yastic of punishment. It should not be a yastic of revenge or of dealing with the, the, the spouse. Not at all. Under no circumstance should we withhold sex. And this is, is, is supported in the Bible. So it's not that I'm making it up. Not at all. No. First Corinthians chapter seven verse five. First Corinthians chapter seven verse five. Bible make us to understand that do not deprive each other. That is so is simple. Do not deprive each other, except by mutual consent. Except the two of you contented that okay, you consent that you are going to for a certain period of time you want to do you, you want to stay so that you can give way to prayer and Bible also encourage that don't do this for long that so that you must come together as soon as possible so that Satan will not tempt you. Not that some 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 women they will use this as a yardstick. No, they will say they are doing marathon fasting. So no touching at all. In fact, they will say that as, as they are finishing seven day fasting, they will enter 21 days fasting. And as they are finishing that one, another 30 days fasting. 
No, this is deception. It's not, it's not godly. Though you are praying, you are fasting, God encourage that. But you need to make sure that when you give room, that kind of room, Satan can tempt either of you. So it's very important that we understand that under no circumstance should either spouse odd or withhold sex. Hallelujah. Now, another question is, did God create sexual pleasure, desires, and body's response to touch? No, when we are talking about sexual pleasure, we are talking about the emotion, the touching aspect of it. Is it instead by God? Who started it? Let's look at the answer in James chapter 1 verse 17. James chapter 1 verse 17. Bible says, every good and perfect gift come from above, from the Father, Father above. Hallelujah. So it's a gift. So why can't you use it? It's a gift. Use it in a godly way. Yes. So our, our answer this morning is yes. God gave the gift of pleasure. So and God wants you to enjoy it. Don't deny yourself. Once you are married, husband or wife, God expects you to enjoy sexual intimacy. Hallelujah. Now, let's quickly look at the benefits of sexual intimacy in marriage. What do we stand to gain? You know, we are going to look at the benefit for the husband, for the wife, and for both of them as couple. So for the husband, one of the benefits, we have 10 benefits here. If you know any other benefit that we are not going to mention or that we that is not that our father in the Lord did not list again, you can just put it in the comments below. One of the benefits for the husband is that it reduces the risk of developing prostate cancer. When there is constant sexual intimacy with your spouse. That risk it will be eliminated. It will reduce it. And for the wife, it improves the bladder control. No, you it, and it, you, it will help it to to tighten the the, the, the cervix. It improve it. And for both couple, it will regulate blood pleasure. Blood pressure. It regulates blood pressure for both couples. Then uh, the second benefit is that it reduces waste and structural pain for the husband. It reduces waste and structural pain. And for the wife, it relieves menstrual and premenstrual cramps. And for both couples, it's burned calories. People of God, we are talking in the contents of marriage. You no, know, a, a young man that is on courtship should not go into this into this angle. I remember those days when we are on campus, you no, know, that some people that always say this kind of nonsense. That they will say, Oh, I'm in pain, I need this. No, not at all. If you are a child of God, even if you are passing through maybe pain, all this pain we are talking about, and you are not married, it doesn't say that you must look for someone to do that. Not at all. That is not what we are saying in that case you need medical advice you need to see doctor they will prescribe drugs or whatever you need to do to reduce the pain but what we are saying we are talking about the benefits of sexual intimacy in marriage so this is benefit number two number three it increase sperm count in the husband when there is constant sexual intimacy it increases that sperm count and it improves fertility in the wife and for the both of them it strengthens their muscle so we can say that if you engage in, in sexual intimacy you need to spend it will, it will help you to save money you don't need to be going to the gym all the time no you may be going there once in a while because you're you'll be strengthening it's a form of exercise hallelujah mm -hmm. number four it improves cardiovascular health in the husband and it builds stronger pelvic muscle for the wife. For both couples, it reduces the risk of heart disease, stroke, and hypertension. And our medical expert has proven this. You will discover that if, if the husband is passing through a certain trouble, pain, what happened? The, the, the urge, the, 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 the test, the longing for sexual intimacy will be, will be completely low. So you can see that when you do this often, hypertension, all these kind of diseases will be far away from you. Benefit number five, it increased immunity and body fitness. Hallelujah. For the husband and for the wife, it help produce more vaginal lubrication. For both couples, it increases libido and reduces inordinate affection. When your husband is well satisfied, you will see that it will even, whatever you see outside, it will not, uh, it will not attract him. Whatever is passing outside, it will not because it's food. It's, it's like someone that is well food and you are bringing food. 
he will just waste that food. No, it's of no use to, to, to him or to her. Hallelujah. Benefit number six. It increases the level of testosterone. It's a hormone in, in the husband. And also, it helps the wife potentially protect them against endometriosis, the growth of tissue outside the uterus. So when you have constant sexual intimacy with your spouse, it prevents this. You can see that it has a lot of benefits. This is how God is so supreme. He's so perfect in all his doings. You know, you know, when you look at the reproductive system, God is perfect. He makes everything to work together. So you can see that God is even concerned about our about our health, our the functioning of our internal organs. He wants them to function well according to how he has plan and destiny. For both couples, it promotes better sleep and headache relief. And this is true. After you have sexual intimacy with your spouse, you see that you, you sleep like a baby. If you have any maybe cramps or headache, they disappear. Hallelujah. Mm. Benefits number seven. It promotes long life. Hallelujah. Mm. It promotes long life for both for the husband and even for the wife also it improves production of hormone estrogen which protects against heart disease and also determines a woman's body sex so this is so beneficial god is so perfect in all he's doing and for both couples when you have constant sexual intimacy it leads to emotional boosting it's it good confidence in both spouse it increased happiness it increased your trust level and, and and there will be more intimacy in love people of god if you are a child of god and your spouse is not with you maybe you have been you have been separated as a result of maybe occupation or distance i pray the lord will bring you together as soon as possible in the name of jesus because this intimacy is very important it's not the plan of god for husband to be in the northern part and the south the wife to be in the southern part not at all that should be intimacy so if as a result of situation you are part i pray this morning that the lord will bring it together to be more intimate with your spouse in the name of Amen. jesus Amen. number eight we are looking about benefits of sexual intimacy it improves ability to perceive identify and express emotion you are the type that you constantly you will constantly have sexual intimacy with your spouse you will know when he's passing through trouble because you will not have appetite for it you can easily perceive it and you go on your knees and pray together and God will solve that problem. But when you are far apart, when it's passing through a particular emotional uh, trouble or turbulence, you will not know. So when you do this regularly, you can perceive when there is something else somewhere. Another benefit is it reduces risk and make couple, it reduces stress rather. It reduces stress and make couples look younger and live longer. And number 10, under the benefit, it helps create a bond between husband and wife. That is why you discover that those, most of our parents that have married maybe for 35 years, 40 years, 50 years, you see they look alike. There have been gene mixing, gene pull has happened. So they have become bonded. There is unity. They have become one flesh. And even be the young ones also. God wants us to be one, to be together. Hallelujah. So that is what we have for us today on that sexual intimacy in marriage part one. We look at uh, the, the purpose of it, so many questions that people people raise, and also the benefits of it. We can see there is a lot of benefits. If you know any other benefit, you can just post it, and we'll be, we'll be happy to, to, to share it and to read it. Hallelujah. So that is what we have for us today. In, in summary, sex in marriage or legitimate sexual intimacy is approved by God for several benefits and you can see all those benefits it's very important but this has to be in the context of marriage this has to be between husband and wife not between man and man not between woman and woman not between man and animal i pray god will help us in jesus name Amen. so in conclusion sex in marriage is pleasurable and it creates intimacy between a man and his wife. Hallelujah. Yeah. So I want us to pray 
We are going to pray this morning that Father should help us to love our spouse. If we are married, let's pray the grace to love our spouse. And if you are not married, you are still, you are still trusting God. We pray that God should bring a spouse that will be a man of God, that will be a child of God, that you will be able to love one another. Let's bow down our head as we pray. Father, we pray for the grace to love one another in marriage. In the mighty name of Jesus, give us the grace to love one another, to drink from our home secret in the name of Jesus. To one another, the grace, Lord, to be more intimate with one another in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, let your bond of perfection hold us together. Love, let love, let love hold our homes together. Let love hold us and our spouse together in the name of Jesus. Help us, Lord Jesus. Help us, mighty God, in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus. Precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you because we believe that you will give us the Lord. You will bond us together in the mighty name of Amen. Jesus. Lord. And Lord, in this sexual intimacy, Father, Lord, for those of us who are married, you will make us to be trustworthy. Amen. Because we're going to give account. Lord, we pray that Lord will not be found wanting. Mm. Yeah. Thank you because you have answered our prayers. Mm. For in Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Shall we rise to our feet and just begin to appreciate the name of the Lord? It's time for us to worship Him once again. I want you to just begin to worship the Lord. I want you to begin to say something good to Him this morning. I just want you to worship His holy name. Lord, we give you all the praise. We glorify your holy name. We magnify you because you are a faithful father. Brethren, let's appreciate the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. Let's thank him. Let's lift up our voice to say thank you to Jesus. He's worthy of all our praises. He's worthy of all our honor. He's God. He's not man. Let's appreciate him. Let's appreciate him. Let's appreciate him for making us who he is. Let's just thank him. Let's appreciate him. Let's give him all the praise. Let's appreciate the Lord of all lords. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we give him all the praise. We magnify your holy name, Father. Be lifted high, be exalted, be glorified. Lord, we give you all the honor. We give you all the praise. Thank you for being a faithful God to us. Thank you because without you, we are nothing, Lord. Thank you because you are God of all God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jehovah. We worship your holy name, Father. We magnify your holy name, Jehovah. We say thank you to you, God. Thank you to you, God. Oh Lord, we give up your name. We give up. We give. We give. We give you all the glory, Lord. We magnify your holy name, Father. Thank you for being our God. 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 Thank you for being our God in all situations, in all circumstances. Thank you for this past week. Thank you for how far you have helped us. We glorify your holy name, Father. Be lifted high, be exalted, be magnified. We glorify you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jehovah. We worship you, God. We glorify your holy name, Father. Be lifted high, be exalted, be glorified. Lord, we lift up your name.
glorify your name. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name, we have worship. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we have worship. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So it's time for us to dance to Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, welcome to church this morning. Welcome to church. Uh, well, I don't know whether we are saying it very nicely. Say, welcome, welcome to church this morning. Say, my, my heart is full of joy this morning. My heart is full of joy. And I will dance more than you. I will dance more than you. I think we are not saying it. Say, my heart is full of joy this morning. My heart is full of joy this morning. And I will dance more than you. I will dance more than you. You know, the Bible says in the scripture, says it, I was glad. You know, I was glad when they said unto me, let us come to the house of the Lord. So it's time for us now that we are in the presence of God, wherever we find ourselves, whether virtually or for those of us who are also here, to dance to God. And I want us to praise God in a new dimension this morning. In other words, let us not look at what is happening all around us. Things might not be going smoothly, but let's praise God beyond our understanding this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. I say let's praise God beyond our understanding this morning. Amen. Are we ready? Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, our heads to Jesus. Oh, you are great, Lord. 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 You are great, Lord.
Father, we worship your name, Lord. We return glory to you. Yahweh is your name, O Lord. We declare you are mighty, there is none like you. We declare your glory this morning. Yahweh is your name. Yahweh is your name. Rahul de Lebro Sobra Shona Shona Ha. We exalt your name, mighty God. With your procession and come into view, O Lord. O Lord, we lift nation in praises of your name. We exalt your name because you are mighty God. Thank you for your move in our nation. Thank you for your move in our land. We declare you are mighty God that is not like you. You are God that all nations will come back and worship. All nations will come back, whether they like it or not. And bow down at your feet. We enjoy you this morning, Lord. We give you time that I could not go to the before God let magnify the Lord. In the Lord is worthy to be praised. We declare that there's no other God except Jehovah. That is no other God like our God. Our God reigns. He reigns in majesty. He reigns in power. He is the host of heaven. We worship you, Jehovah, the Lord that answers prayer. There is no like him, the most blessed God, all sufficient God, the Lord that is more than enough. Oh, black who came from the mountain, we declare, oh Lord, you are more than enough. White springs of mercy and a fountain of of love. We live to praise your holy name. We live to declare your mighty works. We live to declare your awesome deeds. But I will thank you for bringing us to your presence this morning. We worship your name, O Lord. We worship your name, O Lord. For God, let's celebrate our God. Let's celebrate Him. Let's proclaim His wonderfulness. Let's proclaim His great deeds in our lives, in our homes, in our family. Over His church, the light keep on shining. The darkness cannot comprehend it. That's why the darkness is going deep. It's going cross every day. But still, the light is shining. Oh Lord, we say thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, we give time. Amen. Hallelujah. Quickly, I want us to pray this prayer before we proceed. And it's found in Isaiah 25, verse 7. Verse 7. Yeah. Isaiah 25, verse 7. I'm reading from NIV version. The Bible says, On this mountain, it will destroy the shroud that enfold all people. Which mountain is God talking? He's talking about Mount of Zion, on the mountain of Zion. And he said, God, God is saying that he's going to destroy the shroud. What is shroud? Shroud is a cloth, layers of cloth that I always use to embalm people, to, to cover the dead person. Bible is saying that all those shrouds that enfold people, that envelop people, God is going to remove it. He now said, the shield that covers all nations, the shield of darkness, he said as we come to his presence, the Lord is removing it. I want us to pray as we are assembled on Mount Zion this morning, every shield that has covering us, every shield that has covering nations, we remove them in the name of Jesus. We remove every shield that fall on your people, Lord, as we gather to worship this morning. Every coverage, every form of darkness, we remove Remove it in the name of Jesus. Every form of enfoldment, we remove it in the name of Jesus. We declare, let your light shine as the world will be coming out, O Lord. Let your light shine. Let it transform our lives in the name of Jesus. O Lord, open the eyes of our understanding in the name of Jesus. Open the eyes of our heart. Let us see, O Lord. Father, we declare this morning, let us have a seed 
hands and a hearing ear and a understanding heart that we may know what you are freely giving unto us. Our heart desire today, oh Lord, is to walk in your way, is to walk in your way, to know your good and your perfect way. Oh no, open our eyes, oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. We are your mountain this morning, Lord. Every shroud that has been in coffers, that has been us, we destroy them in the name of Jesus. We destroy them in the name of Jesus. Open our eyes to see the way you want us to see. Open our eyes to make us function in the way you want us to function. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we worship you. In Jesus' mighty name we are praying. Lastly, I want us to pray that the Lord should meet every one of us. Both we that we are present here and our online viewers, Lord, today let our life be transformed. We don't want today to be like the normal thing, the normal service. The Lord should meet us at the point of our need. Let's turn it to prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, meet me today, Lord. Meet me today, Lord. Meet me today, Lord. I know what you find and thank you, Lord. I'm keen on to us, oh Lord. Your word says as we are saved in your year, so shall you do. Today, Lord, we pray, Lord. Oh Lord, how much we are going to say in your presence. Oh Lord, do it unto us in the name of Jesus. Yahweh, we have talked about who a shepherd is. 
the attitude and attribute of a shepherd. We have talked about that. And we said, Psalm 23 is the commonest and the most quoted scripture in the world. It is quoted in preaching, in music, in literature, in everything that we do. And the reason why it is like this is because it is relatable. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. It's relatable, it inspires, it comforts, and it comes out. Hallelujah. We have said the Lord, when we use the word they, it means that we are talking about one God. I mean, there are gods, but there is one God. Hallelujah. We have also talked about the Lord being Jehovah, Yahweh. We said when we say the Lord is, we mean only one God, the Yahweh is. It means that it is current now. So that's why we say Psalm 23 is very relatable. Because it's not a past tense. It's a, it's a present tense. It's a continuous tense. Hallelujah. And when we say my, the Lord is my, you know what it means? We said it is personal. It is about us. It is not the Lord is our. The Lord is mine. Amen. It's a personal relationship. We said David understand the, the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. And that's the reason why he said the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. David was once a shepherd. So you understand the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. Hallelujah. You understand the art of the shepherd. You understand the attitude of the shepherd. You understand that the sheep has three things. If you recollect, we said the sheep is dumb. The sheep is dead. And the sheep is what? Dependent. <laughs> Hallelujah. You understand all these things. Let me understand all these things. So, and I told us last week that when we understand the meaning of the Lord is my shepherd. Then we have laid the foundation to which we can begin to see the benefit of the Lord is my shepherd. And today by God's grace, we are going to start with one of those benefits. Hallelujah. So the core of Psalm 23 is that first part of, Psalm, of verse 1 of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Once you understand why the Lord is your shepherd, then it is very easy for you to relate with Him. Hallelujah. It is not, if the relationship is not there, you cannot enjoy any of the benefits. If you don't take the Lord as your shepherd, there's no way you can enjoy any of the benefits of God being your shepherd. Hallelujah. So today, we want to talk about the number one benefit that you enjoy. When the Lord is your shepherd. And that's why we are going to talk about I shall not want. Hallelujah. I, I thought you would say to your neighbor, I shall not want. I shall not want. Now, let us start with what David said in that scripture. He didn't once again say, we shall not want. He said, I shall not want. In other words, I shall not want. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I shall not want. Brethren, personal want is different from congregational want. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And we must start by identifying something. There's a difference between want and needs. Hallelujah. There are differences between want and needs. We should not interpret want with need. They are different. What is want? Want is wish or something that you long for. Hallelujah. Want is what you wish or what you long for. Want is what you desire. It could be an immediate desire or it could be a future desire. That is want. Hallelujah. Amen. And one of the characteristics of want is that want is limitless. Amen. Amen. But what about needs? Needs are a necessity of life. Do you see the difference? 
What is what you long for, what you desire, what you wish? On the other hand, needs are necessity of life. Needs are those things that are necessary, that are necessary to sustain life. Amen. Amen. We need food. We don't want food. I don't know whether you are getting it now. We need water. We don't want water. We need shelter. We need clothing. It's not something that I want. Those are what? Needs. Amen. You see, we as human beings, we could be sometimes irrational by making our wants, turning our wants to need. It's not correct. Praise the name of the Lord. I don't, don't think that because you are a child of God, we don't do this. Many of us as Christians, we have turned our want to what? To need. David is an example of this. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 14 to 17. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 14 to 17. David said, And David was dead in an old and garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed. Now, listen to it very well. David did what? Longed. Which means he want. And said, oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem. That was by the gate. And took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof. But pour it out onto the door. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. Now, at any particular time, I mean, as you, can, as you have read in this Bible scripture, David wanted the water. Water is a need. No mistake. But what did David did? David said he wants the water in Bethlehem. He specifically told them where they are, where he's going to get that water from. That is a want. And after those guys have run, the three mighty men, they've run to go and look at and check that water. When they brought it, he understand that there's a difference between the want and the needs. And he could not convert his want to a need. Praise the Lord, the name of the Lord. Then he wanted to convert his want to a need. Maybe you are listening to me this morning. And your word is a message this car. You know, recently, me and my wife and the children, we drove. And when we were driving to a particular city, I mean, like far away from us, there was this message, this best car that was just when I wanted to overtake him, he would cool down. As soon as I overtake him, he would just start running and then he would overtake me. My wife was saying, ah, you see now, the difference between a Mercedes-Benz car and your car. A Mercedes-Benz is a, is a big car, it's a nice car, it runs very fast. Now I can, I can now say, okay, I, this Mercedes-Benz runs fast. I want a Mercedes-Benz. And I put everything that I want to do on that Mercedes-Benz. That's not the point. That's not the point. Maybe what you need is just a car to move you around. Hallelujah. Maybe you want a big house. Very big house. And sometimes we do so. We want house with 20 bedrooms. As if we are going to be sleeping in each and every of the bedrooms. Maybe all what you need a house called home. Hallelujah. Amen. I travel a lot due to the uh, uh, due, to, due to my work uh, uh, situation. But you know what? There's no place where I travel. There's no how big. I was I was in an hotel sometimes. They, they said it's a uh, the place where they put me was a presidential suit. It was as presidential that suit was. I couldn't feel comfortable except I'd be on my my small bed. 
maybe all what you need is a quo. It's not necessarily where you have, where you go, big things. Maybe all what you need is a quo. But because of our wants, many of us have messed things up. Hallelujah. Yeah. So when David said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What does it mean? Praise the Lord. It means that he believed that God will take care of him. God will take care of all his needs. Tell your neighbor this morning. God, I can't hear you say, God, God will take care, take care of all my needs. Of all my needs. Say it again. Thank God, God will take care, take care of, all of all my needs. So when you make the Lord your shepherd, you know that your needs already sorted out. Now, listen. In that popular scripture that we normally know, read in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. The Bible never says the Lord will supply all our needs, all our wants. Scripture says, the Lord shall supply all your needs. Because what is not an in the equation. That is why David said, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Because he knows that want is not what you need. And when he promises you that he's going to take care of all your needs, he means it. He means that he's going to take care of your deepest need. He means that he's going to is aware of every of the need in your life. It means that he will he has everything to take care of your needs. It means that you, the sheep under the shepherd, will have everything that you need. It means that you will lack nothing. You will lack nothing. The Lord shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. One thing that doesn't mean is that. He will, he will have everything that you desire. That's not what it means. Praise the name of the Lord. What it means that every of your need, God will supply. And I declare to somebody listening to me this morning, every of your need, God will take care of it in the mighty name of yeah. Jesus. Number two, when David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It means that he gives satisfaction. Hallelujah. It gives what? Satisfaction. As human beings, we are not contented. I've not seen any human beings who doesn't want more. We always want more. We want to add more to more. We want to get more. But when you make the Lord your shepherd, God gives you satisfaction. It, it makes you to be content. You know, the grass can never be greener at the other side. Because it's only the shepherd who knows where the grass is green. And when he promises you that he's going to, if you make him your shepherd, you shall not want. It means that you will enjoy satisfaction. Hallelujah. Philippians chapter 4 verse 11. Philippians chapter 4 verse 9. 11. Peter, I mean Paul says, speaking says, not that I speak in respect of want. Look at Paul saying. Not that I speak in respect of want. For I have learned. I think some of us, we need to learn these things. Said, for I have learned. In whatsoever state I have, there we to be content. This, hallelujah. Said, in whatsoever state I am, there we to be what? To be content. Paul was contented. Never speak in respect of words. Let's learn. Contentment can be learned. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. In Psalm 34, verse 9 to 10, Psalm 34, verse 9 to 10, the Bible says, they've been talking, Oh, fear the Lord, he is saved, for there is no want to them that fear him. He understood this thing very well, for there is no want to them that fear him. He now went ahead. To, to define what he means by that. He said in verse 10, he said, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord 
shall not want any good thing. In Yoruba language, we normally say this. We normally know that that, that scripture is very well. They that put their trust in the world, in the Lord, rather, they shall not want any good thing. But you've heard the Lord lacks in your life. Amen. Amen. In Psalm 84, verse 11, Psalm 84, verse 11, David also says, For the Lord God is a son and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. When you make the Lord your shepherd, you trust him. You have a relationship of trust with him. It means that he will always provide. He will always what? Provide. And he will never, never allow us to do what? To suffer. When you make God your shepherd, you shall not want. Now you may be in need. He's going to supply all your needs. But want is not in the equation at all. Number three, when you make the Lord your shepherd, what does David mean by I shall not want? It means that the Lord, the shepherd, will provide for you. Amen. Amen. The shepherd will do what? Will provide for you. Number four, the shepherd will pay all expenses in food. And number five, when you make the Lord your shepherd, and David saying you shall not want, it means that prosperity is sure. Hallelujah. Amen. Prosperity is sure. And I, 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 I want to say this. We wrongly define what prosperity is. Praise the name of the Lord. We wrongly define what prosperity is. Now, many of us think that prosperity is money. No. It's beyond money. We always define, ah, if you, if you say you are prospering, it means that uh, you have houses, you have cars, fleets of cars. Recently we heard about people who, who, who had, in fact they had private jets. And at the end of the day, what do they, what do they find out? They found out that they, are, they, are, they got the money illegally. They are now in prison. What will all those things teach today? What is prosperity? Well, let me define what prosperity is for you today. Prosperity means to have options. Simple. Alright. I've got rice. I've got beans. I can choose between rice and beans to eat. That's prosperity. Hallelujah. In other words, what you need, you have them. You don't need to beg for it. That's prosperity. Doesn't mean that you you, you have fleet of cars, but if you if you have a car and you God is laying it in your heart that you should change that car and you are able to change it, you are prosperous. Praise the Lord. That's prosperity. Now I want to give you and many of us we we, we found a problem with prosperity. And a lot of us thought that a Christian cannot be prosperous. It's a life from the pit of hell. And today I want to give you five reasons why God wants you to be prosperous. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 32. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 32. It reads, Therefore I say unto you, take not no thought for your life. I read it last week. What you shall eat or what you shall drink. No, yet for your body, what you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the more and the body than remnant. And I want to go to verse because of time. I want to go to, to verse 31 and 32. Say, Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do you then try see. For your heavenly father knoweth that he have need of all these things. Shepherd, he knows that you have needs, and so there's no reason why you cannot make him your shepherd because he's the only one who can supply you all your needs. 
praise the name of the Lord. So why do God want you to be prosperous? Number one is that the shepherd is interested in your prosperity. The shepherd is interested in your prosperity. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. Jeremiah 29 11. It says, For I know the thoughts that I have seen towards you, see the Lord. Thoughts of peace are not of evil. To give you an expected end. Job chapter 22, verse 23 to 24. Job 22, 23 to 24. The Bible says, If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy canal of Then shall thou, then shall thou lay up gold as dust, and the gold of opium as the stones of the bush. God wants you, He is interested in your prosperity. That's why he said, you shall not what? Want. He's interested. He doesn't notify God that you are poor. You know, I wanted to say something again this morning. I had it. I think it was Bishop David Oedeko that said this thing. And I wanted to confess it with your mouth this morning. Not because you are doing anything. Say, I shall never be poor. I shall never be poor. I don't know whether you, are, you know what I'm saying. Say, I shall never be poor. I shall, I shall never be poor. be poor. God is not glorified in your poverty. Poverty doesn't glorify God. That's why he said in 3 John 2. 3 John 2. He said, Below, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper. That is his wish. He wants you to prosper and be in earth even as thy soul prosperates. That's the wish of God. God is interested in your prosperity. I mean, the fact that things are not going smoothly now does not mean God doesn't want you to prosper. No. Maybe you have not made in your shepherd. That's why things are going like that. God is interested in your prosperity. Number two. God delights in your prosperity. He's not only interested, he delights in it. In 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 20, 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 20, he, he said, He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. One of the names of my wife is Delight. Hallelujah. And to delight means that whenever you see something, light comes. It places darkness, gives you happiness, gives you joy. Prosperity, your prosperity is a delight of God Almighty. In fact, God wants to use you to be a testimony to others. Number three, your prosperity gives the shepherd pleasure. In other words, God is excited in you doing well. God wants you to be established. Hallelujah. Amen. God is delighted. He gives the shepherd pleasure. Psalm 35 verse 27. Psalm 35 verse 27 says, Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteousness cause. He let them say continually, The Lord be magnified, which had pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. I wanted to say it again. I will never be poor again. I will never, never be, poor. be poor again. You know, God has pleasure in your prosperity. It gives God pleasure that you are prosperous. It doesn't give God pleasure that you are poor. That's why in the book of Proverbs, the Bible says, See thou a man that is diligent in his work. What does the scripture say? It said he will stand before kings and not what? Me, man. Number four, the shepherd paid the highest price for your prosperity. The shepherd paid the highest price for your prosperity. That tells you that he's delighted, he's interested in your prosperity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. The Bible says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen. 
that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became what? Poor. Why? That he through in his poverty might be rich. God, when last week we were celebrating Easter, the death of Jesus on the cross, the reason why he went to the cross, he was a very rich man before he went to the cross. He became poor at the cross so that you and I can be what? Can be rich. Can be prosperous. God has paid the highest price. The shepherd has paid the highest price for you and her to be rich. Sent his only begotten soul to pay the price. He was rich. He became poor so that you may be rich. You don't need to doubt God. You need to be contented like Paul. Paul said, I have learned to be contented. And then number five, why I believe that God is interested, God wants you to be prosperous, is that God promised it. God promised it. And one thing that I know of God is that whatever he sees, he does. In Numbers 23, verse 19, Numbers 23, verse 19, say, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. And he said it, and shall he not do it? Or had he spoken, and shall he not make it? Good? And there are a lot of scriptures where he said it, that you should be prosperous, that you will be prosperous. You can read John 36, verse 11. John 36, verse 11 says, If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity. I thought somebody would say amen to that. Amen. Say, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. The only thing that you need is to obey and serve him. In Exodus 25, Exodus 23, sorry, Exodus 23, verse 25 to 26, said, And ye shall serve the Lord your God, and ye shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. Let us look at what verse 26 says. They shall not cast their young, nor be buried in thy land. The number of the days are fulfilled. God has promised you. He just needs you to obey and to serve him. Make him your shepherd. You will never, never be in want. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19 says, If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the food. those who are tough, you know, I always wonder that, look, why is it that people run away from prosperity? Some people feel that to be a Christian and to be prosperous is not something that is possible. It's a life of the of God. Maybe because they define prosperity in a different way. You know, what God wants you to have is to say, okay, he created all the things and you can choose which one you want to eat out of it. You've got options. Now let me conclude this morning. What are the conditions for prosperity? The first one is faith. Believe. In John chapter 1, verse 12, John chapter 1, verse 12 said, To those that believe, he gave the power to do what? To become the sons of God. Believe. Faith. Hebrews 11, 6. Hebrews 11, 6. Said, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You see, the power to give wealth, the power to create wealth is in the hands of God. When we get to, let's go and read Psalm 50. Psalm 50, you will see all those things that are there. Number two, Obedience. Obedience is key. Like we read in Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19 says, If you be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good fruits of the land. God wants you to be obedient in all that you do, all that He tells you to do. That is part of being, I mean, allowing God to be your shepherd. Number three, 
holiness and repentance. You've got to be holy. A simple person cannot come into the presence of God and expect to be prosperous. You know? The, 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 the thing that is simple, the prosperity, or, or let me not say the prosperity, the world, the money, the houses, the cars that the simple person has, it will not give him satisfaction. Hallelujah. And that is why many people who are rich today, or so called rich, they are not satisfied. A prosperous person is what? Satisfied. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. Now, this, this is very well. Proverbs 28, verse 13. The Bible says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Sin is as simple as that. He that covereth his sins cannot do what? Cannot prosper. A sinner will not prosper. Number four. Titan, offering, and seed are those things also that can make you to be prosperous. The Bible says in Luke chapter 6 verse 38 give and it shall be given back to you. Give and it shall be given back to you. Me and my wife of recent, I'm using my wife as an example because she's the closest person to me. And as an example, we were talking about this thing recently. And we said, look, when we give, we get more. When we ought, it's, it's, a, it's a principle that is logic come to man. When you have, you want to give, you want to save. That's the principle of, of man. But when you save in the hand of God, hallelujah, you give it to God. And give it to God does not mean that God doesn't have. Give and it shall be given back to you. And then number five. Your words can make you prosperous or make you clean. Both of them start with P. Your words can make you what? Prosperous or what? Or true. What do I mean? As from today, don't be negative. Check the scripture, locate the promise, and pray it. I will be the head, I will not be the tail. That is it. I will always be the head, I will not be the tail. I don't care, I don't care. I move it. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 1 says something. Say, at the end of every seven years, thou shalt make a release. Now, let me tell you something. What your word, your word says, is it matters in the eyes, in the sight of God. Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth does what? Speak it. What you are thinking in your heart is what you speak. I used to say this. It's only a fool that will say something. I will not have thought about it. Today, don't be negative. As from today, confess it with your mouth. I will never be poor. I will eat the fruit, the good fruit of the land. Declare it to yourself. The Bible says in Third John two, say God wants you to be prosperous. I am prosperous. I shall not want. I shall not want. I think you should be able to do that very well now. Every morning. God, you have promised me you shall supply all my needs according to your riches in glory. When the need comes, God arises from heaven and supplies. Should I surprise you this morning? There's a level that you reach in God. If you meet all these conditions, that God will keep on surprising you. Now look at this. The Bible talks about Abraham. That Abraham was great. When he was describing Isaac, he said Isaac was very great. When he was describing Jacob, he said Jacob was exceedingly great. Which level do you want from God? Which level do you want from God? What are you saying with your mouth? Let's head up on our feet. As usual, hallelujah. 
our challenge for the week this week is I want you to check your wants and needs and see whether you, your want has been turned into a need I want you to look whether your want is rational or irrational I want you to look whether you have already given up on something or someone that this person or this something can never be happening again. Look at it this week. Challenge yourself. Take a time. Look at those things this week. One single prayer point that we are going to pray this evening, this morning, brother. We're going to say, Father, Father I release myself to you. Meet all my needs. I want you to cry to God this evening. I release myself. Now tell that thing to God. Tell it to God. Tell it to God.
You can attend our services 9 a.m. on Sundays and 6 p.m. on Wednesdays. And as you come with us, God will bless you in the name of Jesus. And like we have said today, one of the ways to be prosperous is by paying your tithe and paying your offering and paying your sin. If the Lord is laying in your heart to do any of this, please drop your offering in the account that is going to be posted on the, on the comment section of the Facebook that you are watching from us. As you do so, God will bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. Let us share the grace and fellowship all together with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Shalom, you are blessed. God bless you.